All right, great. Hello, everyone. Good evening, maybe good morning or wherever, depending on the wherever the world you're in. I know we have an international crowd, uh, not just people in the United States, maybe also too, um, if you get a chance, because I know there's going to be a lot of people filtering in. Let us know where you're tuning in from, what state you're tuning in from, what country you're tuning in from. My name is Teron Myers. I am the Director of Operations here at SHI Macrobiotics. For those of you who do not know who I am, and excited to welcome you know, newcomers as well as people who've been here for our webinars before previously. I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly here as well too. But as I said, once again, welcome to everyone. I'm excited to be able to go over this topic that Denny Waxman is going to ha has prepared for us tonight. Um, really quickly, quick disclaimer, all attendees, just so you know, you, you recognize that this webinar is not intended for any medical treatment or macrobiotic counseling. So anything that's said here tonight is information, um, you know, you'll take it, you know, take it as is. Um, but once again, this is not direct medical advice or counseling. Um, so we always want to make sure that you may know about that. And the topic that we have here for tonight specifically is common problems of longtime macrobiotic practitioners. And this just picks up where we left off of our last topic last month. Um, which we covered in great, great detail about surprising deaths in the macrobiotic community. So we thought that this was a, a really suitable topic. And a lot of you who attended that last session actually chose this specifically. I think it was about anywhere from 30 to 40% of people wanted to hear about this. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Denny. Um, he's going to speak for about a half an hour or so. And then we'll also have some time for Q&A toward the end of about, I would say, maybe 15 minutes maybe 20 or more, depending on the amount of questions that we get in. And as always, of course, this is being recorded in case you're not able to make everything. It will be present on our Facebook Live right now. And then I'll also make sure to send that within the next 24 to 48 hours. So I'm going to turn it over to Denny now. Thank you so much, Denny. Thank you, Teron. And hi, everyone. It's good to see so many people from all around. I see a lot of uh, names that I recognize. So welcome. So tonight is basically my observations and interpretation and understanding about you know what what our history is, and you know first I really like to express my uh, appreciation to George and Lima Sawa, Mutual Novel and Kushi, Herman and Cornelia Ihara, Shizuka Yamamoto, and all the people who have brought us to this point, and. Macrobiotics is really a work in progress. We're really learning, you know, how to adapt traditional practices to, to modern life. So just a little brief history. George Osawa started macrobiotics, and I like to simplify everything to its most simple point. And the essence of George Osawa's approach to macrobiotics is how to neutralize yin, to make things young. That was really the essence. Now, that's understandable. In post-World War II Japan, Japan opened its doors and they brought in Western foods, white rice, potatoes, sugar, and all these things really had a devastating effect on the Japanese people who were still eating a, you know, a much more traditional diet and lifestyle. And George Osawa realized this and had great success. So everything we did, um, so bancha twig tea, which is already roasted four times, we roasted it again. Sea salt, we roasted it to drive out the yin. Onions, we'd always cook first to drive out, out the yin. Whatever it was, and we had gomasio, we had teca, we had these uniquely young condiments. And everything was done to move people more from yin to yang. And it had a Germanic effect especially in the early days, George Osawa was so bold, so restrictive, and people were looking, you know, in the 60s and 70s to change their consciousness for something that was more meaningful. And George Osawa was there with that. And people, including myself, had, had dramatic changes in results. The Kushis then in the, uh, in the 70s realized we really had a relaxed macrobiotic practice. And they did everything to open it up and to make it more wide. So instead of advocating diet number seven, all grains, they created the standard macrobiotic diet, which is far more balanced, which really worked for a long time. And there were a lot of dramatic recoveries um, 
in the 70s and 80s, I mean so many, from this restrictive practice and at times no oil, sometimes for long periods of time, high rice, high grain. I did it myself. I mean, I lived for a lot of my macrobiotic meals on rice balls, pressure cooked brown rice, which you can press and make more yang, put a new moshi plum and more yang, toasted nori, a bit of yin in there. <laughs> so rice balls and then soba and broth was like the mainstay with the a hint of vegetables here and there. And that's what I, you know, I really lived and flourished, however. And um, I've done diet number seven probably as much as anyone. I mean, for weeks, sometimes for months, uh, trying as, as long as I possibly could, eating some other foods and going back. And quite frankly, I've been spending the last 20, 25 years trying to recover personally from that restrictive practice uh, that that I you know enjoyed and recommended for so many for so many years. So the problems were recommending a high rice, high grain diet, which at the time worked. But see, the problem is what they didn't realize is life became more and more sedentary over the years. And we had less and less contact with nature, less and less outdoor activity. We became less active and we started to sit in front of a computer screen for, you know, a lot of our time. And what this did is it weakened everyone's digestion and nervous system so that we couldn't eat literally a high grain diet anymore. A high rice diet was too strong. We just couldn't process it properly. And it started to really create problems. Second, macrobiotics was all of his Japan centric. It didn't acknowledge the world's cuisine and, and traditions in, in the way that it could. They were, they were mentioned. And what we've gotten from Japan, the essence is, you know, still the core of, of my macrobiotic practice and recommendations today, but it's, you know, much more wide. Then the other problem was excessive attention to what we ate and chewed, how much we chewed. You know, in Michio's lectures, if you didn't answer a question really, they said, what have you been eating? Or how much are you chewing? This is like the standard thing. So you think, oh no, I have to eat better. I have to, I have to chew more. Not acknowledging the, the lifestyle. And I had this conversation with Michio a number of times. He said, no, everybody knows these things. I said, Michio, everybody does know these things. You come from a culture where sitting down to eat regular meals, all these things are natural. They're part of who you are. You take them for granted, but most people don't know these things at any rate. We couldn't agree. Then one of the biggest problems is people who came for serious health problems, who after couldn't adjust to a more relaxed practice. They were afraid if they ate just a very relaxed, very macrobiotic diet, their sickness would return, but not realize, realizing the opposite was actually more true that there was much more danger in eating a restrictive diet for too long than eating a relaxed diet. So observing and experiencing these things, you know, personally, and then seeing what was happening with my clients, I figured, okay, we've really got to change what, what's going on. So I, I want to explain something about yin and yang. And the, the problem, see, the problem is when we eat a restrictive diet, for too long, it starts to close down our digestion and circulation. And I, I felt a need to reinterpret acid and alkali because the way it's taught, I thought it's not really effective. It doesn't go with yin and yang and couldn't figure out how do you use it with macrobiotics? So I reinterpret it. And the essence is that stagnation of any kind creates acidity. A stagnated environment at home, sitting in front of a computer all day, eating too much grain that we can't process. All of these things, eating too strictly, started to create an acidic condition in these people because of changes. So it really started to affect people's digestion and circulation, also nourishment. So I, I created this simple diagram. It's, it's kind of bare bones. And there, there's essentially 
I think Tehran's going to share my diagram. So hopefully it, it, it'll make sense. Okay, here we go. Can you, you can see, see it as well? Yeah, I, I, I can see it. Okay, I may be able to. Oh, it's a bit too big. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should. Yeah, that, that's great. Okay. So in the, in the top one, standard, if we eat more yang, we move more to the right, we get more yang. If we eat more yin, move more to the left, we get more yin. So we eat more fish, we eat more salt, more well-cooked foods, we get more yang. We eat more salad, fruits, oil, and sweets, we get more yin. Then to get more yang, you can reduce yin, you move or to get more yin, you can reduce yang. So that, that's the basic way we use yin and yang. However, in the lower one, moving into the center. So the center, the meeting point between the two is grain. To the right of center, we'd say is fish. To the left of center is beans and vegetables by moving into the center. So by this second diagram, diet num number seven, all grains, is the most young diet you can possibly practice. Uh, so I, I hope that makes sense. And if you move out, add more yang and more yin. So even if you add buckwheat and fish, which are quite young, and then at the same time, you add salad and fruits, you're moving out from the center. So even though you're having more yang in your diet, you're actually becoming more yin. It's becoming more wide. Okay, so I, I hope that makes sense. So what the kushis did is they refined the cooking and the practice. But in refining the cooking and practice, they made it more clean like blanched vegetables, they're yin, but they're clean, there's no excess. Quick steam greens, same thing. It's very clean, but there's no excess. So in a way, when we eat them, we get yang because they're moving us more into the center. They're taking away all excess. So at one point that occurred to me that for today, we have to take a different approach. We have to move out from the center and we have to widen our diet. Now, what that means, and, and the reason is, so the environment started to change in the mid 80s, when the food supply really changed and high fructose corn syrup, more refined foods, and it really started to affect people's health. Then by the mid 90s, they introduced glyphosate, GMO foods, which dramatically changed the food supply, but it, it did another thing because glyphosate is a desiccant. It's a drying agent. It's used to dry grains to make the harvesting process more easy. Plus a lot of the pollutants that are building up are also desiccants, they're drying agents. So what happened is we had, and then the increase of electromagnetic fields and radio waves. So you know how the technology has increased over the years, especially since 2000 and dramatically, and dra dramatically increasing 3G, 4G, 5G, et cetera. So we're blanketed by these electromagnetic fields, non-ionizing radiation but all radiation, ionizing radiation, like x-rays, et cetera, are drying. So if you get x-ray for cancer, it's drying it. But non-ionizing radiation from, from electricity and magnetic fields is also very drying. So then we had this situation where all of a sudden we hear about staying hydrated. It was never a problem before. No one ever thought about it. I drank very little liquid for a lot of my macrobiotic practice. But then I got to the point where I thought, wow, I need to drink more and more liquid, you know, just, just to feel satisfied. 
And it started to occur to me that many things that we did before that were young and strengthening were too strong. They were, they were too strong. Then the other thing that, that happened is um, crying was a very prominent part of macrobiotic practice. We used to eat fried mochi, we ate fried tempeh, we ate tempura, we deep fried tofu and cooked it in dishes. For many years, there was an oil pot on the stove. We used it all the time, up until, I mean, 20 so years ago. But the point is, frying, pan and deep frying are very young. Baking is very young. All these things are very young. And as the environment becomes more young, these things, even though they're traditional, started to become harmful. So a lot of macrobiotic people, fried food became their go-to. You know, after a seminar, we go out and you go to Russia and often there's not much to eat. So, you know, depending on whether you like coffee or beer and then you get French fries. Seems simple enough, just French fries. But then I got to the point, I realized these are not good, you know? If I eat a French fry, which I ate plenty of, believe me, um, I don't feel when I started to realize it's really fried foods are not really suitable anymore, except for special occasions. So this is kind of the, the, the change, the, the thing. And what's very difficult, and I still have this problem of thinking, well, brown rice is best. High grain is, is best. The specialty macrobiotic dishes that, that we learned, the Japanese dishes are best. And that if, if we have an Italian meal, you know, is, is that really a macrobiotic meal? Of course it is. But for many years, I went to the thing is that, is this really macrobiotic? Because people used to say that. I'd be in a restaurant ordering something I thought was healthy and someone would come in and say, are you allowed to eat that? It happened all the time. I said, well, I'm allowed to eat whatever I want. I mean, it's, it's my choice and I, and I choose. So, but, but the point is to get these ideas out of our head and out of our consciousness. And the other thing that was a big part of macrobox in the past was low protein. So it was low oil, low protein, high grain, twice as much grain as vegetables. And getting these things out of mind, it was basically Susan who kind of introduced me to vegetables <laughs> and, and started my, my love with vegetables until it came to the idea grains and vegetables need to be equal or more vegetables. So we got have to lower grain for everyone to keep macrobiotics healthy. But the part of what was inherent in macrobiotics made it almost impossible to spread because anyone practicing macrobiotics knows we have something unique. But when it's so different from what other people are doing, it creates a gap, it creates a separation. It's not similar enough for people to be open and to accept it. That's a real problem. So at any rate, these, these are my suggestions of for long time macrobiotic people to really reflect on their practice and to, you know, appreciate what, what we've done before and the uniqueness of the Japanese foods. But, you know, you have to realize Japan is a small, salty island. Living in Japan is like living in a pressure cooker. I lived in Japan for nearly a year and a half. Before I went, Jim Ledbetter, who was Micho's most brilliant student of all times, and we were good friends, and we're having lunch at Sinai restaurant. And he said to Michio, don't you think Denny's crazy wanting to go to Japan? Because a lot of macrobiotic people went off the rails and they went to Japan. And Michio said, yes, nice crazy, but crazy, of course. So <laughs> I decided to go anyway. And after I came back from Japan nearly a year and a half, confession, I ate cheesecake at the Marriott Hotel every day for six months. And it saved my life because it helped me readjust from Japan to America. One day I said, God, I don't like this anymore. What am I doing eating cheesecake? But I, I was done with it. So 
I'm just trying to put in perspective how young the practice was at that time, but we had a different condition. It kind of made it okay. But at the same time, people who did that, like myself, do pay a price because it creates a kind of hardness, rigidity inside that takes a long, long time to, to really get over. You need open practice and good physical activity. So first thing is to realize macrobiotics is a diet within a lifestyle. It's not a diet. It's a way of eating and we have a unique lifestyle. And so much research is coming out about now of the importance of taking time for meals, the importance of not eating before bed, the importance of eating within a certain window, time-restricted eating, all eating at certain times, all of these things are coming out and which are uniquenesses to the macrobiotic diet and lifestyle. So to realize it's a diet within a lifestyle, then the next most important thing is to realize macrobiotics is a traditionally based, it's not a traditional diet. It's traditionally based on all of the world's longstanding traditional cuisine. Asia, Middle East, Europe, Americas, Africa, Australia, Oceania, all of the world's long-standing traditions. We've taken the most unique foods and practices from each one to create the macrobiotic diet. And in order to move forward to spread macrobiotics and for our personal health, it's important to acknowledge and embrace, to include, to respect our past, the things that we've come from that were so unique, but also to eat, the, you know, whatever, whether you like Italian or Mexican or Indian, whatever you really like to adapt it to macrobiotic practice. So basically, we have one so-called typical macrobiotic meal, real macrobiotic meal, I'm joking, a day. And, and then our second meal is usually pasta or Mexican food or, or some different type of cuisine. And I think the balance and polarity has made all the difference in the world. And the, the other thing about that is that other people can accept that and say, well, I can do that. I can eat this kind of, oh, I can eat pasta. You mean I, you know, I can eat white noodles? Well, they're not really white noodles. They're door meat semolina. They're, they're, they're partially refined. So what we've done in macrobiotics is taken all of the foods that were used traditionally that are unique. So all of the grains, but one of the things is unyeasted sourdough bread. It's a natural fermentation. And Michio was always against bread, whether it was here in Europe, we used to have disagreements, you know, and, and the European friends, especially in Northern, Northern Europe said, you can't practice macrobiotics here without bread, which, which I agree with. But I think it's almost impossible now, except for limited periods of time, to practice macrobiotics without bread here. Real unused sourdough bread that, that we steam and put tahini or hummus or peanut butter or whatever. And people think, well, it's not a healthy food, but it's a traditional natural fermentation if it's real unused sourdough bread. And here in the Philadelphia area, we're lucky because we have Sweetwater Bakery, which is just, I mean, truly amazing bread. Um, so at any rate, so to include bread is one thing. Another thing is to not eat too much miso soup. Sweet vegetable soup, quick shoyu soup, mixed vegetable soup, minestrone style miso soup. It's very, very important. Now, if you have a specific health problem that calls for miso soup, that's a different story. But I'm talking in general health. And if you've recovered from a health problem, then it's very important to eat like a healthy person. This is really important. I've had so many clients in the past, and they ate the strict diet, and they had remarkable recoveries. And over the years, I tried to get them to widen their diet 
And it's tell them, if you're, you're healthy now, you need to eat like a healthy person. It's very, very important. And the ones that couldn't do it, then as they got older, they really struggled with health, with health problems again. It might not be the original problem, but with others, because it's just too restrictive. So even if you came to macrobiotics for a serious health problem, once you recover, give it six months, give it a year, then you need to eat like a healthy person and enjoy all types of healthy cuisine. I tell my clients, don't choose dishes you think are healthy. Because if you choose something you think is healthy, it means young. It's going to make you more young. Instead, choose the most delicious satisfying foods from a full healthy foods list. There's a huge difference. One is opening, the other is closing. So this is what I think, you know, if for our personal health and to move macrobiotics forward, people think, well, we're giving something up. So we don't recommend pressure cooking anymore for the most part, except for long cooked beans. We always recommend cooking brown rice with another grain. A lot of people think they're diminishing the rice, they're losing something, but it's the opposite. You're actually gaining something because there's a synergy between the two. And, and this is literal. If you cook brown rice and you cook barley and you measure the nourishment you can get from each one, then cook them together and measure it again. You get more nourishing from the rice and from the barley than if they're cooked separately. Right. So when I visited, lived in Japan, I visited Korea twice. At that time, they didn't have plain rice. It was all barley rice. And I absolutely loved the rice there. I loved it more than Japanese rice. And it always stuck in my mind. And then I started to experiment over time, thinking there, there's really, really something to this. So the point is, we've to practice macrobiotics, it's a work in progress. We're always adapting it. The environment is, is not getting healthier these days. Pollution is, is not getting less. And we're not spending more time outdoors, which, which is a real harm. So we need to think about how much time we spend indoors, how we can adjust it to get as much natural light and sunlight as possible, how to get more activity into our life, and then how to have a much more relaxed and varied macrobiotic practice. And I think if you do that, then um, your health will improve in almost every way. And next time, um, I've been asked to talk about, um, about where to source healthy macrobiotic foods and what to do if some of the specialty foods are, are not available. And they, they have a number of ideas on that because as you might know, Japanese foods are getting harder and harder to get. And not only that, they're getting more and more expensive. And that's here and in Europe, it's everywhere. And I don't see there being a solution um, in, in, in the near future. So we, we've got to think how to keep macrobiotics as healthy as possible and to adapt it you know, at the same time. So these are my ideas for, for a long time macrobiotic practitioner, adapt your diet to current times to eat like a healthy person for now and to have respect for our past and to use those as, as we need them. Because for health and healing, that they have unique qualities that you know other foods or dishes don't have. So we need to find that right balance between the two. So I'm ready for questions if you have them. All right, well, thank you so much, Jenny, for that. So now it, the time is 7.30 Eastern. We will begin our Q&A section now. So we'll be taking questions from both here on Zoom and also to um, for anyone that is viewing on Facebook Live. We'll also be taking questions there as well. Um, there are a couple ways that you can do the questions. You can either send them directly here to the chat. I'll send a quick message. Hello. Um, you can send a question to that and I'll just read it out loud. Another option is if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question verbally, 
Um, you can do that. I just ask that you wait to be called upon so multiple people are not speaking at once. And also keep in mind that if you are going to ask your question um, verbally, that you will be on the recording. And I just ask that all questions be specific to the topic at hand. Um, once again, no specific medical or counseling related, related questions also <clears throat> too. So thank you. We'll, we'll start taking some questions here. So our first question is, what are the harmful effects of eating eggs? Are there any instances when eggs are recommended? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good question. So there's two movements in macrobiotics. One, there's a big vegan movement. The other is there's a movement to include more animal foods. Now, including more animal foods is a natural, again, adjustment for excessively strict eating for too long. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm an observer. I watch every, what everybody does. And I know that the people um, that are now advocating we should include some animal foods as far as macrobiotic practice. I know how restrictive and how high salt, how high salt their practice was for a long time, which as I said, restrictions restricts our nourishment and does lead not to malnutrition, but kind of to an undernourishment. Now, having said that, if you're healthy and you want to include some free range eggs in your macrobiotic practice. I don't, I don't see a problem with that. You know, it depends on the person, but it's, it's a choice. Personally, I'm not vegan. I eat fish. I go through stages. Sometimes I eat eggs. Sometimes I stop them for long periods. It, it, it depends on, you know, on, on how I feel but I try to follow my appetite and my needs. And, you know, what concerns me, there's, you know, macrobiotics is based on, you know, history, what people have done before, and there's been no vegan cultures. The closest is Japan, historically. But even they, they were vegan, two uh, kilograms per person per year of animal foods. So um, traditionally. So basically holidays and festivals, there were some animal foods. But the important thing now, whatever you eat, it should be real food. And I've never had an impossible burger and I haven't had a hamburger since 1969, but if given the choice of an impossible burger or a hamburger, I would eat a real hamburger any day of the week. And I mean that 100% eat food. Don't eat fake food. Whatever you eat, it needs to be real. Okay, thank you. Kathy, can you please rephrase your question? Um, we, are, we cannot answer questions about any particular medical providers, counselors, or health practitioners. So if there's a way that you can rephrase your question so that I can pose it, thank you so much. Our next question is, how do you feel about nightshades now? Well, we include tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, when they're organic, locally grown in season. So when you can pick them from your garden or from the farmer's market, the rest of the year cooked. Now, unless you have a problem like arthritic problems that really respond or certain, you know, autoimmune problems that really respond to to nightshades. Other nightshades, I would use caution. Tomatoes are unique. They, they're far less harmful than potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants. Now, if you're healthy, enjoy them all. Don't eat a, you know, a whole lot. So there's still not like, I wouldn't recommend adding potatoes back in, into your diet except for special occasions. But if you're healthy, I wouldn't shun them either. All right, thank you. So our next question that we have here, looks like it's a two-parter. Could you suggest any specific things to say to food service managers to help persuade them to add more plant-based options to their K-12 cafeteria menu? 
That's the first question. Well, that's that's a difficult one. Other than it's becoming more and more popular, and more and more vegan and vegetarian restaurants um, are popping up, and more restaurants are vegan friendly. Um, so, other than that, uh, I, I don't really know. I don't know if the health aspects would appeal to them. Was there a second part? There's a second question, not a not a part two that to that oh. particular question. So I'll just um ask that. Is there anywhere to order teca? <laughs> I don't know if natural import has teca, but why why would you want teca? Teca is beyond young. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen teca made. You have to chop the lotus root burdock and carrots until they become translucent. Just chopping it is enough. Then cook them with hot jo miso and sesame oil and ginger all day. Um, it is a process. And when I lived in Japan, the first place I lived, um, I lived below uh, Alcon and Darbin Yamaguchi. They were students, very prominent students of of George Osawa. And they used to host macrobiotic meetings at their house, and I went to one of them. And they served this very simple meal. And the dessert was like six or seven wild strawberries, which are like minuscule. You almost miss them on your plate. And someone passed around homemade teca, and everyone took a spoonful of it. And after this meeting, and it was on the mountain, I ran down the mountain to a coffee shop and ate a ton of ice cream and orange juice because I felt like I didn't feel human anymore. It was, it was beyond young. I used to love Tekka. And I have a, a package yet, you know, once a year for old time's sake, I put a sprinkle on something just to remind myself how young it is. But uh, my question is, why would you want Tekka anymore? Use burdock or lotus root of carrot in cooking. It's too young. But natural import might still have it, I don't know. All right, thank you. I'm gonna ask if we can hold all questions for now. Uh, we're almost at 740, so I wanna make sure that we can address the questions that we have without going over. Our next question is, what do you think of Ezekiel bread? no yeast, sprouted millet, barley, lentils, and flourless. Well, when you sprout a grain, the complex sugar breaks down to simple sugar. Then you concentrate it into the sprouted bread, which means you're really eating concentrated sugar. So I don't think it's a healthy food. I mean, I ate my share um, of the seen bread you know, sprouted bread or Ezekiel, whatever there, there was, until I finally realized I did, and all my clients who used to eat it used to have digestive problems and liver gallbladder problems from just the, the kind of sugar that's present. So what we're meant to eat is unyeasted sourdough bread, some wheat-based bread or, or rye-based. Rye now, Sprouted seeds, I think, are very good. Sprouted pumpkin and sunflower seeds that are available now, sprouted and dried, I recommend them highly. They're very good. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Our next question, what is up with the disappearance of Ryujin ume plums? The crop failed. <clears throat> they had a bad crop. So I do hope they return. There's been no Maboshi plums like Ryujin. Not even close. Okay. But, you know, my suggestion is when you find high quality macrobiotic foods that you like, buy extra stock up because more and more of these things will disappear. 
you know, it's 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 sad but true. All right, thank you. And I know Denny is going to be going about this a little bit more in the next upcoming session in November. So stay tuned for more advice about <clears throat> that. Okay. Excuse me one second. I'm just going back and forth between Facebook and Zoom. Okay, our next question. Since I've started macrobiotics, I've developed sensitivities to chemicals, perfumes, etc. Is that common occurrence with people on macrobiotics? It's not common, but it does happen. So there could be a lot of causes, but it might be just eating too simply because you become too sensitive. I mean, I realized that Years ago, if I ate too simply, really the way I preferred to eat, I couldn't function in society. I couldn't function with other people around me. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to relax our diet to, to the point. But um, if you have certain health issues, immune or heart or increases sensitivity to, you know, to odors. All right, thank you. So Denny, for individuals that may be used to brands of tofu such as Bridge, et cetera, and they're not able to get that, can you provide some advice on how they should choose their tofu? The number one important thing is non-GMO, organic non-GMO. The second important thing, if you can find one that's made with nigari, magnesium chloride, even if it has Nigari, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride, both. So I don't expect healthy tofu to disappear. Because America makes the best tofu anywhere. I mean, the, the bridge and fresh tofu anchor is like the best tofu I've had. Um, but if you're places where you can't get them, the really important thing, as long as it's organic, non-GMO, it's fine. All right, thanks. And I'm gonna to skip to this question just because it is about tofu. Um, what about sprouted tofu versus regular tofu? I, I've never really tried sprouted tofu. We've always eaten regular tofu and um, absolutely, I love tofu. So I just, I, I stick with that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so our next question. The vegan movement celebrates all kinds of vegetables, beans, fruits, etc., without thinking about part of where things come from. Right. Also completely banishing added oil, olive, sesame. Would you comment on this? Well, there's some uniquenesses to macrobiotics. Number one is indigenous, choosing foods from the same or similar climatic zone as to where we live or reside. That is a very, very important uniqueness. Second, emphasizing local and seasonal, which is very, very important, which also emphasizing food quality, right? Sim sim simply processed. and all of those things are just, you know, not only uniquenesses of macrobiotics, but essential for, for health going forward. Now, I know there's a big movement towards no added oils. And I can't agree. Well, first of all, according to, uh, you know, nutritionists and epidemiological scientists that I respect, they think oil is part of a healthy diet. Now, Macrobiotics follows tradition. The two most traditional oils with at least a 6,000 year history are olive oil and sesame oil, both of which can be mechanically pressed at low heat. So they've been made naturally for thousands and thousands of years in cultures that have great health and longevity. Together with that oil makes your diet more satisfying Together with that oil helps in the absor absorption of minerals and fat soluble vitamins, which I think is a very, very important thing. 
So they'll say, well, the fat in the food does the same thing, but I, I question that. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I advocated and ate very little oil for years. And I saw what happens to, to my clients who ate no oil for too long. They really got, kind of got depleted. And when they had oil back, they, they did far better. So I think using, and the other thing about only using oil in cooking, I don't agree with either. I think oil is used in food preparation, including salad. It depends on the quality of the oil. Always get the highest quality oil you know you can find and use it so it integrates into the dish so it doesn't taste oily. But I would not recommend being oil-free. Now, if you have some serious heart issues that you have that are time sensitive, you really have to change your condition very quickly. Yes, yeah, stop oil. There are certain other problems that if you stop oil, they'll improve much more quickly during that period. Yes, by all means, but not in the long run. And certainly the uh, people are advocating now than now originally weren't so anti-oil. They were much more relaxed, but certain others were so adamant, no oil now ever. So a lot of people I think kind of jumped on the bandwagon. All righty, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna only just take the questions that are now remaining in the chat because we're getting close to our um, cutoff time. Um, so I have three questions and we'll just end with those. One of them is a pretty easy question. Let's see here, where did it go? <laughs> Disappeared. Oh, what brand of sesame oil do you use and where do you buy it? Well, Flora is generally available F-L-O-R-A, the light sesame oil, it's very, very good sesame oil. We still have some that we've had for years, some um, Irade Japanese sesame oil, which for went that unique flavor, you know, th then we use that. I have another comment about oil. Commercial oils that are used in food preparation of almost everything are very harmful. I mean, you know, it's one of the major, major problems with, with people's health today. It's the biggest problem with eating out. How do you avoid bad oil? It's a, it's a real concern. So even if you like to eat out, like me, you have to limit it because of exposure to, to those oils. So um, I just want to throw that out. But flora sesame oil is wonderful. Where do you purchase these? Well, you can get it at a scene, you can get it at Whole Foods or Mom's. Mom sells it. It's in your know, you know locations that are not, because um, these are more local locations, any? That I don't know, but if you search for F L O R A, it's always in the refrigerated section. Okay. Their, um, their sesame oil is really very good. This is a really funny question. I think I'll add that one toward the end. <laughs> all right. Um, our next question that we have here. Okay. Where did it go? Okay. Okay. Hi, Denny. Would you talk about gums that are put in foods? I worry about all the gums put in packaged food. My family and friends who are gluten sensitive buy breads and flowers with gums. Gums? Gums. I guess like gore gum and all those yeah yeah well none of them can, can be healthy i mean um i think it's better to avoid processed foods as much as possible um if you look at anything like the number of ingredients keeps growing and growing where unused sourdough bread is you know flour starter water and salt it's so um, I would just buy whatever it is as the most simple ingredients that you can find. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm just going to minimize this just a little bit to the to the question. So this person says they never quit their they stay true to their macrobiotic practice 
They never quit their coffee. Is having coffee only once a day with no milk okay? If it's organic filtered coffee, yes. Pure black. All righty, thank you. And um, this question I'm gonna ask, is it true that if you eat bridge tofu, you'll live to 100 years old? I, I, have, I have no idea, but it, it's not gonna work against that, that's for sure. I don't, know. I don't know where that question comes from, but you know. Okay. This is good tofu. Excellent. Okay, well, that will be our formal Q&A segment. Um, I do have some closing items that I want to make sure individuals know about um, regarding the next webinar topic and some upcoming events. Um, before I go into that, Denny, did you have any um, final things before that or any other remarks? No, thank you. I, ho I hope this has been helpful. And um, I hope the next one also um, about adapting our, you know, food selection and what, what to do moving forward. Um, I, ho I hope that'll be very practical too for people. All righty. Thank you, Denny. So I'm just going to move into just some closing remarks um, for those that want to hear about some upcoming things that SHI is doing. For those that I know that may be, you know, I'm leaving right now, thank you for tuning in. Um, as a reminder, this is just a disclaimer that I said in the very beginning. Anything that was said during this webinar session, just remember this is just, um, you know, advice information that Denny's providing during this time. It's not exact medical information for you or personal macrobiotic counseling. So we still advise to be able to get that type of advice if that's something that you absolutely need. Um, I always remind people the recording will be available within, any tw within 24 or 48 hours. Um, so I'd say that ideally I would like to get this out by tomorrow, but it may be Friday morning. Um, I usually get a lot of emails and calls. So as a reminder, the recording will always be available, um, but it is on Facebook right now. So if you do have a Facebook account and if you follow Denny, it's already going to be uploaded because we're streaming live right now. Stay connected. We have a lot of ways to be able to hear about more macrobiotic information, both Denny and SHI have their own websites, their own newsletters. So if you're not already subscribed to those, we definitely recommend to subscribe so you can get the up and up on what's going on in the community. Um, our next topic is a topic that individuals had the opportunity of choosing the last segment, and it's going to be about being flexible with common macrobiotic staples. So this is important because a lot of people asked about where can I get this? Where can I get that now that I can't get access to this? So that next seminar webinar is going to be Wednesday, same time, um, November 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern. So I will have a link for you to be able to register the, to that in the email that I send out with the recording. Um, so make sure you keep an eye out for that so you don't miss out on that information. Also too, um, if you did not know, we do have another macrobiotic conference that's coming up. It's coming up in a little bit over two weeks now, um, <laughs> November 5th through the 6th. Um, I'm not going to go through all the names. The presenters are listed there. Um, it's a very, very amazing lineup of presenters. Of course, Denny and Susan, individuals like Colin Campbell, um, Nouriel Kushi, and a lot of other individuals that are now in the macrobiotic community are going to be presenting for those two days. And the theme is the mind-body connection. I will have a link to be able to register for that. Unfortunately, we're already past that early bird phase, but I know a lot of you have already had the opportunity to register to receive that. Um, but we still do have discounts for individuals who may be seniors, teachers, medical professionals. And if you are a student or know a student, um, we have a really, really good price for that conference as well too. Um, register for a course. We have courses at the beginner level, intermediate, as well as advanced training for counselors. So if you're looking to you know, delve in a little bit more into your macrobiotic practice or help people with their health and wellness, this is something that will be really, really good for you. Also to share, share this webinar once that link is available, share some of the recipes that we post on our blogs, share a blog article, and of course, share the ultimate guide to eating for longevity, um, the book written by both Denny and Susan Waxman. So um, also to the last thing that I just want to make mention is that these webinars, these free webinars, conferences, or just being able to be transparent with information would not be possible without individuals who contribute and donate. Um, and we know that a lot of individuals who are on this call right now are regular donors. Um, it sounds you know, cheesy, but really every little bit counts um, and really it helps us to become sustainable and to offer more information and goes with our mission of educating individuals to create lasting health through diet and lifestyle principles like macrobiotics. Um, so we say thank you. Um, at this time, if you wanna just give your you know, thanks and appreciations to Denny, you can either send it in the chat, feel free to unmute yourself and you know, once again, thank you so much and have a great night, everyone. So feel free. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Teron. Good to see you.
Thank you, Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bless Thanks, you, Jenny. Ron and Denny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denny. Thank you, very Denny. Thank you, Denny. Denny. My pleasure. Alrighty. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you again for attending. Thank you. Thanks for all. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.